I walked in and they were like, hey, um, I'm not sure this is working out. And I was like, me neither. Do I have to stay to the end of the day or can I leave now? <laughs> and they were like, you can leave now. And I was like, cool, here's the key. Awesome. And I literally left and I drove right to you. What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up, what up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh, Rebel Radio is going down. What do you say? Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, Rebels? Welcome back to Rebel Radio, the weekly show where I bring you the rebels who are shaping our culture. I'm your host, Josh Levine, and let's get into it. This is a big one. Uh, part one of a two-parter, part two coming up next week with my man, Evan Bogart. If you're not familiar, Evan is a hit songwriter, music publisher, record executive, Grammy winner. He's worked with Rihanna, Beyonce, Jason Derulo, a long, long list of, uh, of superstars. And he's an old friend of mine. He actually uh, worked for my company briefly many, many years ago um, when I was doing artist management. And he would come to my office during the day. And then at night, he would go in the studio with Eminem making uh, that first album. And uh, Evan's career is, is absolutely incredible. He's got some tremendous ups and downs that he's going to talk to us about and and just some, some crazy lessons learned. He's also... Uh, the executive producer and music supervisor of the new movie Spinning Gold, which uh, he made with his brother Tim and his other brother Brad. Um, and it's about their father, Neil Bogart, who's a recording industry legend. He was the founder of Casablanca Records, which was the home to Kiss and Donna Summer and the Village People and Parliament Funkadelic and really uh, defined the disco era. So we're going to talk today about Evan's amazing history in the music business and and like i said some some crazy shit he went through to get to where he is today and uh next week we're going to come back and we're going to talk all about the movie so let's get into it right now with evan bogart well I, there's a lot more i want to talk about the movie but i want to talk about you okay um and obviously we've we've been friends we've known each other i think 25-ish years, yeah. something like that, and uh, and had the pleasure of getting to work together for a, a little bit of that time. Um, so, do you remember the first record you ever bought for yourself? Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the first record, but it was either the Fat Boys okay. or License Dale. Both awesome records. And, 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 uh, Either way, it was the same year. It was 86. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so I was eight. Yeah. And so, yeah, obviously, when, when we met, you were uh, a crazy hip-hop fan and rapper. Yeah. Um, and so how'd you, how'd you, I know you, obviously, you grew up in a musical family, um, but you were rapping as a teenager. How did that, how'd that happen? Are you saying that rapping isn't musical? Yes, you know, you know that's my <laughs> that's my strong opinion. Um, um, how did I end like up, how, rap, how'd you how end, end up how'd rapping? You end, yeah, how'd you, oh, okay. how'd you get on a mic? Or how did I end up in a musical family? No, no, um, no. <laughs> um, I um, I loved rap music from the moment I heard it. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I, it resonated with me in a way, I, honestly, I really connected with the rebellious nature of it. Mm -hmm. And the feeling, it, it made me feel kind of like, um, it made me feel like, I don't wanna say tougher, but like, it, made, it gave me confidence mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't have naturally, sure. I think. And, um, and then I wanted to be, I wanted to be the person who like knew all the lyrics by heart at like birthday parties. So I can impress the girls and stuff. And sure. The songs would come on. So I learned all of the songs. Nice. Like, literally, I would, I would transcribe all the lyrics. Oh, really? Yeah, I'd write them all down and memorize them. Wow. Um, I think at one point, two, me and two of my good friends in, in elementary school, like, shortly after License to Ill, I decided I was Mike D, and the other one was Ad Rock, and the other one was MCA, and so we would learn all their parts. Nice. So, like, if the Beastie Boys songs, like, Paul Revere come out at a birthday party, we would all do the parts. That's and a really smart way to do it. It was things. really impressive to, like, yeah, fourth, for sure. fourth graders and third graders and shit. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> a smart way to do things. Um, but I was, like, very early on into, like, <laughs> very obscure... I think I learned it from like watching Young TV raps. Yeah. 
and shows like that. Sure. Um, Rap City. Rap City, yeah. <laughs> but like really, really early on, I was into like some really obscure shit that people were like, what? Like, and uh, I remember I was like the first kid who like, I remember going to like Music Plus in Westwood mm -hmm. <laughs> and being like, do you guys have Wu-Tang Clan? And yeah. they're like, who? And like, cause I had seen like sure. the Protection Act video or whatever. And, I, and so like, or like I was the kid who showed up at school with like the deep cover cassette and people, mm -hmm. and I remember this one kid, older kid going, Snoop Doggy Dog, what a stupid name. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, he's an idiot. Where's that no, kid? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, no, but dude, I was that's showing hilarious. up. I showed up in seventh grade yeah. wearing like public enemy medallions uh -huh. to school in seventh grade and shit. Awesome. Like and I was like a I was like a fan of like, you know, in retrospect, like a lot of pretty um anti Semitic rap music. Sure. <laughs> or like gangster rap. Yeah. You know, I just I just really it's pretty eclectic in the in my tastes. I was I felt like a real affinity to like um, I remember going to summer camp and I, I just started to think of things I listened to in summer camp were like Big Daddy Kane and Cool Modi and mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of commercial stuff like young, obviously like Young MC and Tone Loke and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But then um, also like some pretty, pretty obscure shit, um, Eric B and Rakim and stuff mm -hmm. that like, you know, 10 year olds aren't really listening to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll say this, when I was 10, I heard Me, Myself and I mm -hmm. and fell in love with Dela. Um, and uh, my brother Brad, my older brother Brad, played me the Three Feet High Rising album for the first time, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Holy shit!" I was totally blown away by it. Yeah. And I became a lifelong uh, card-carrying member of the Native Tongue family. Like mm -hmm. I just obsess over everyone in that in that crew, and, and then you know became like probably the I consider myself the biggest Tribe Called Quest fan on earth. Um, Okay. And but I'm sure some I'm sure people would, would I, know, I know I know people some folks that want to challenge challenge me on that but but I'm pretty yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty uh, I'm a pretty big tribe fan and De La fan but mostly tribe yeah. black sheep obviously yeah um, so I find J it interesting. JBs but I didn't know about the JBs until after De La and Tribe like okay. I went back and learned it. JBs obviously were way earlier but they like were I first. yeah I didn't yeah. I wasn't like you I wasn't. Young. A I was young, but I, w I wasn't. I didn't connect with it. Like their, right. like their shit was also on, was was also on Rap City and Young T mm -hmm. Raps and stuff. But mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't connect with it. Like when I first saw, you know, De La or I mean, they also K lacked the Boogie Down Produ Boogie Down Productions or commercial is not the right word because all that music is. It's hard to label that music. J as commercial, the Jungle Brothers were less accessible. Right. They That's just. They said. just were. Yeah. They just were. Yeah. For sure. You know. Um, and um, and then. Um, Cabron White. Do you know Cabron? No. He's Maurice White's son. Oh, okay. From Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, yeah. Cabron and I went to elementary school together. Nice. Cabron played me NWA mm -hmm. for the first time. Um, and it was the Ethel for Zagan album, mm -hmm. which I'll always call it that because <laughs> they gave us the ability to call it Ethel for Zagan. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, I fell in love with. NWA went back and listened to all, all of the yeah. earlier stuff. Yeah. Um, I went to an NWA Public Enemy concert uh, with um, with Cabron and my friend Ollie and my stepdad. And uh, the uh, NWA came out to a barrage of machine gun fire, which everybody like hit the deck because nice. they thought it was real. And then yeah. Public Enemy came out. Chuck D did like a forty five minute uh, speech about how the man is the devil, and uh, I was like. It's <laughs> <laughs> like okay, That's <laughs> we, awesome. um, but I was I'm just this is just I just was in love. I was in love with everything about it. It yeah. didn't matter to me. Like I didn't I didn't know half the shit they were saying. Yeah, I mean even the Beastie Boys. Mm -hmm. Like you think I understood what like you know my manager's crazy. He always smokes dust. I didn't know what that right. meant when I was a sure. kid. I just I rapped it though. Right. <laughs> He's yeah. got his own room at the back of the bus. Like I I would do all the lyrics, but like I didn't know what the bus was. I didn't know what smoking dust was. Fair enough. You know, that's I didn't know what the Eggman was. I didn't know any of that shit when I was a kid. But yeah. like I loved it. I didn't know what Cookie Puss was because I'm not from Becky's. Yeah, um, um, I love Doc Canelli too. Though I didn't know what that was either. But something about putting it in your mouth. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I don't know, I have, I have a few questions to build off of that, but, but one thing that, that strikes me yeah. is, right, so you, you were sort of part of a social circle of Beverly Hills hip-hop kids that I <laughs> yeah. uh, started hanging out with. And if there was a reality show, if reality shows existed back then, Beverly Hills hip-hop kids would have been a, a huge... 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> really popular show. Absolutely. <laughs> I think a couple of those people were on reality shows. Eventually, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what was interesting, because I'm older and I grew up, you know, in different generations. I just had a different experience, right? And so uh, what, one of the things that struck me was like how underground the taste of that group tended to be. Like you guys. Oh, dude, I listen to so much. Like so, the underground so shit I listen to. It's like so beyond. Like I can't have conversations with people today about things I listen to. I'm like, oh, yeah, you guys remember Yag Fu Front? Right. They're like, what? Sure. I'm like, yeah, the UMC. Like people don't. Yeah. Like, most people, even hip, even like people are like, oh, I was a hip hop head in the 90s. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, well, that, yeah, 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 yeah front, course, right. you know, and they're like, what? They and think I'm like, like step to the left. You step to the like, I've never heard that song. Like, right. all right, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, I, what I'm wondering is like, now you make pop music. Yeah. And so, at the time, obviously, culture, you know, was different, but hip hop had a very antagonistic relationship to pop music. And oh, yeah. So, how does that? How does that background and that, that music that was so formative to you, how does that shape the music that you make now? Um, I mean, it depends what I'm writing now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the through line connection is, is that I write music, when I write music, I try to figure out how it's gonna make people feel. Mm -hmm. And the music back then that I listened to made me feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of, like, talk about, like, um, suburban white kids, you know, listening to, like, gangster rap, you know, when I was sure. growing up. There was, yeah, there was yeah. that was the thread, right? That was, like, the whole, like, thing, right? Yeah. Like, really, you know, because it's something you couldn't be and it was dangerous and stuff like that. Honestly, it just, it made me feel, it made me feel like there was a, there was, like, a, freedom to it, a mm -hmm. rebelliousness. It didn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't the danger of it, but it was, it made me feel like I, I was part of something that, that wasn't the, the, you know, the, the norm, sure. the commercial norm of it. Um, and it made me feel a certain way. And then as I got into other music, um, other, uh, other types of hip hop, like, I feel like, um, certain things would make me feel another way. Like, like if you think of like, like when I first heard Tupac, Dear Mama, mm -hmm. I, I cried. Mm -hmm. That made me feel that way, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, I hadn't, obviously, my mom wasn't in jail, like a feigny, I, right. but I lost my father. Sure. Like I found like some sort of like yeah. th through threads there and stuff like that. I think yeah. great music makes you feel a certain way. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter what the genre is. Um, so for me, like I try to write music that makes someone feel something. Mm. Now, I like writing music that makes people feel happy, for the most part. Sure. Um, I'm not like a big, like, sad songwriter. <laughs> I'm not, I just not, I never have been. I've written a couple songs that have been, I mean, there's, that have been, there's that have been sad. To do that. No, there's people fine. who are amazing at that. And yeah. I just, I don't really like writing about sadness. Right. That's just not my, 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 my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, I like writing things that are like, either like. I mean, knowing you, you're, you're always an upbeat person. You're yeah, mostly. Like, yeah, yeah. And so like, this is not. It's just not fun for me to sit in a room and like toil over something that's like depressing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound fun to me either. But um, some people, some people thrive in it. So was it a foregone conclusion that you were gonna work in music, like, or did you, yeah. or did you ever, did you explore anything outside of music? No, I like flirted at one point with maybe going to like sports caster camp. Okay. It's a moment in time. Other than that, it was always music. Okay. I didn't know what I'd do in music. Right. Um, I always assumed I would do something like my dad. So um, talk about that, because you had twists and turns. I didn't, I, was, I looked you up last night, I didn't even realize you spent time as a booking agent. Yeah. Um, and you know, we spent time together doing management and, yeah. and the Interscope mailroom. And yeah. So, um, so, it took you a little while to sort of find your yeah. lane. Yeah. Well, it's, in seventh grade, I bought it. I bought an SB twelve hundred and uh, Techniques mm -hmm. and a Newmark mixer mm -hmm. with a that also had a built-in sampler, so I can get like a few more seconds of sampling time. Of course. <laughs> than my twelve seconds that uh -huh. the SP came. Unbelievable. <laughs> or eight seconds, or whatever the SP right. SP came with. Um, but the uh, 
you know, and then I started recording with all like all my friends who rapped and like or wanted to rap, and we mm -hmm. would like write stuff and like. So I thought there was a point in time where I thought I'd be a performer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I was 16, I started interning at Interscope. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 18, I started working in the mailroom there. And then I tried to get myself a deal. Trug Trugman and I went to New York with my By dad. the way, labels love that when you work there and you're trying to get signed. They didn't know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. like I was advertising it. Right. But me and Justin Trugman went to, to New York uh -huh. and took some meetings with my demo. And it wasn't gonna happen. It wasn't gonna happen. But we did go to the... Uh, what was it like? Uh, was it the Flatbush Mall or one of okay. those? One of those. <laughs> we went. We went. Amazing. We were wearing uh, North Face puff coats and Tim and Tim's. And of course. We uh, we went there so that Justin could go front front shopping. He was sure. going to buy uh, emerald fangs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Not surprising. Yeah, it was good. Good times. Anyway, but. Um, yeah, and so I just was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna get signed. And yeah. uh, but it's funny when I made my demo, I was splitting studio time with the Alcoholics, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we were working at at uh, a studio called Yo Mama's House. Oh yeah, behind the liquor locker on Sunset. Nice. With the the engineer was forty to the head, Fred, who did all the Alcoholics records. Sure. And so we were we were splitting the days up. It was like either the Licks and then us, or like DJ Honda, mm -hmm. or like a few other people were in there at any given time that we were there. Nice. Um, I did my demo. Baby doll sang on it. No way. Remember? Do you yeah. remember that? She sang a chorus on it. I did not remember that. Oh. Baby doll sang the chorus on one of my songs, on my demo. Uh, um. <laughs> oh, Leela James. Now. Is that what it is? Yeah. I, yeah. But yeah. But I, but yeah. So and then uh, I didn't get a, and then I was working in the mailroom at Interscope. So I just kind of settled in for that ride, and I thought, you know what? I'll just be. I'll just work in the business. I won't be. Yeah. I'll be like my dad. You know. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, I was working on my first project, which was the first posthumous Tupac album, mm -hmm. Are You Still Down? Um, where I got to meet like amazing people like Soul Shock and Carlin and Tony Pizarro, and you know, obviously spent a lot of time with Afeni and mm -hmm. the Outlaws and, and Thug Life and Mo Preem and those folks. And, um, and then right in the middle of that, that first Eminem album. Um, and so I worked a lot on that, some shady LP. Mm -hmm. Um, which, um, yeah, I guess depending on who you talk to, I, I either discovered it or I didn't. <laughs> sure. I did, but... We know you did. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, well, take... <laughs> here's what I've never asked you. Yeah. Because I know that story, um, and I, I, I know you found that and, and brought it in. So when... Uh, and, I, and I've told this on this show, one of my great moments uh, as a manager yeah. was, you know, we had started working together and you're like, M's looking for management, we should manage him. And I remember saying, and I'd heard the demo, so, right? And I was like, yeah, this dude's incredible. I don't really know about white rappers. I don't think anyone's <laughs> going to give a shit. But if no, you, one, no one really know about white rappers. And I, and it, well, sure. Fair enough. It was Vanilla Ice and Marky Mark. Yeah, and, I mean, and, to, to and my, uh, in, in my defense, right, there was yeah. no precedent for no, it, none. and yeah. it was something that I personally had no uh, love for. Not M, but just white rappers in general. It does, I didn't have, there were no white rappers that I loved. I mean, yeah. Beastie Boys are kind of put in their own category, but it wasn't my thing. Right. And, um, and so I, I remember saying, like, I don't really care about this, but if you're into it, like, let's take the meeting. And then I think we had a phone call with him, and it didn't go anywhere. And in retrospect... I was certainly not the right manager for him because I didn't think it was the greatest thing that the world needed to know about. Yeah. Um, but I totally missed the boat on it, right? And and I was I was dead wrong. A and, lot of people missed the boat. Yeah, of on course. It. And that's kind of what happens with, with a lot these of things. Artists. So uh, I'm not I'm not beating myself up about it. But um, <clears throat> but what I've never asked you is what what'd you learn? Going through that, like, you found this thing that you knew, I mean, everyone knew that, like, Evan knows this is the greatest shit ever, and, uh, and you were proven right, and you didn't get the credit that you might have gotten, or the, the, you know, you didn't have the opportunity to sign that and, and you know, really launch your career in the stratosphere that, that it might have happened if it went a different way. Sure. What did you learn from that experience? Um... To be more open to receiving help, mm. 
and um, to not try to not try to be such a lone wolf and do things on my own. Yeah. Um, you know, I had That's the big one. I had the benefit of uh, I had the benefit of my mom, who sure. was a successful manager. I could have gone to at any time and been like, "What do you think I should do here?" <laughs> right. You know, like, but instead, I just was kind of like, I winged it. Yeah. And at the end, I did a lot of that at, at that around that time, and I and that's a big regret for me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a lot of people that could have helped me. Sure. You know, if it wasn't my mom, like people in her network, yeah, and people she knew in yeah, the industry sure. could have advised me on how to handle that situation the right way, mm-hmm. um, or could have even gone to Jimmy, people that were like notable if my mom knew that right. was what that was what's going on not like on a tattle tattle tell my mom <laughs> mom i'm not getting credit on this record but like look i mean i try I, not i'm not I, I what i didn't what i didn't learn from there which i'm thankful i didn't learn from there is not to trust people mm-hmm. right there would be an, it would be a really easy thing to get fucked over sure. by your best friend at the time yeah right let's just say cuz i like I, I don't like i'm not like voldemorting this like dean geislinger um, what up, Dean? And, yeah, what up, Dean? Dean listens to the show. Yeah, okay. Hey, Dean. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, I got screwed over by a fucking social climbing con man. Yeah. And uh, who proved out to be that, right? Who right. tried to social climb his way sure. through Hollywood and got fucking, you know, shoved out of Hollywood <laughs> and never was allowed back in. But, like, um, it would be really easy for me to take that as the lesson and be like, I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to, like, close up. I'm going to, like... Or like tuck my tail between my legs and like scurry off into another industry or something mm-hmm. like that. And instead, yeah. I was it, it empowered me to go do it again. Yeah. It empowered me to be better at what I do, and empowered me to learn from that. Um, the other thing was like you know I was like I learned I should always have paperwork, but that's not also true. Like I've had a manager for fifteen years Doesn't that we're, on, we're on a handshake, yeah. and I would would rather you know jump off a bridge than screw him over. Right. You know what I mean? He's Absolutely. he's a friend, and yeah. so um, I think. I think what I learned from that is to not be afraid to ask for help Mm -hmm. and to know that you're not alone and you know that there's people around you that you can always tap into and and hear, get advice, get advice from people and not wait for somebody to come and save you to to go out there and, you know, ask for help. That's a great one. Um, Well, while we're on the topic of of lessons, (laughs) so obviously, you know, you didn't grow up with your dad. Yeah. um, But you've heard the stories, you've, You've uh, now made a movie about his story. What do you think you learned from his legacy that you carry with you today? How how has how has he influenced you in your your career and your life today? Uh, well, I think his biggest influence is me in me is intangible. Yeah. Like, I think there's something that's like you know the nature versus nurture mm. thing that like okay. I can't you can't really put your finger on. There's things that like. I mannerisms and things that I do that sure. he did, and I, yeah, yeah. I, I he died when I was four. Right. There's no way I would have learned that from him. There's very little video. Sure. Most of it's at the end of the movie, <laughs> in right. the credits, right? Yeah. Like, there's not a ton of footage for me to like yeah. have have um, have learned a lot of the things that I do. So I think there's a there's like a a trust my gut element of it. There's like an there's like a listening to the voice inside me, the ear. Like, there's certain things about the tenacity, the passion for music, the belief in in in, in music, and and the un, unwielding conviction about things mm. that I think just come that are just genetic. Because mm-hmm. I don't know, you know. Um, I mean, it's interesting. The conviction. My, my, my mom, by the way, is all, was also a badass, right? Sure. And like, I learned a lot from her too, yeah. right? And I think she raised me the right way. She raised me to be kind and generous. And like, there's a lot of things that I learned from my mom, which are pretty amazing. Um, but there are also just intangibles that I just, mm-hmm. so I think it's a little bit of nature and nurture, but I think from, from my dad, the thing that, that I've, that I've taken is hard. It's not something that I like intentionally took. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. That's I appreciate that. I kind of want to start a podcast called "Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off." <laughs> <laughs> Just two people talking <laughs> over each other the whole time. I love it. Um, I mean, you, you bring up a good point, which is that uh, you know one of the things that stood out about your dad in the movie, right, is he just he knew, right, that these songs or these artists had to break. And, uh, you know, there's a theme in the movie, I just need more time, right? And, and, um, and I think music in particular, but probably most of culture and society, 
was about people knowing that they were right and everyone else just didn't get it. And they set out to prove that to the world and yeah. both to both like beautiful, amazing and terrible consequences. Right. If you think of all the people that just yeah. refuse to accept societies uh, not getting what they knew to be true. Um, I like, have felt that way about artists that have gone on to be humongous successes. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Eminem, for sure. Yeah. The fucking second I saw him. Yeah. I was like, this is unlike anything that's ever happened. Yeah. And through the making of the album, and every time he would go on the beat mm -hmm. or Friday Night Flavors, or every time I would just hear him freestyle and be hanging out at the Oakwood Apartments, like, everything about him screamed, yeah. this kid is something special. Yeah. Even when the album was ostensibly shelved and they went and funded the Hi My Name Is video out of their own pocket. Mm. Philip Atwell and Dre and them and oh, paid wow. for it out of their own pocket. And I, I remember walking it onto set and looking at DJ, Jimmy's nephew, mm -hmm. and saying, where's M? And he's like, he's right there. And I turned around to the left and he was sitting there in Marilyn Manson makeup. And I was like, this is going to be fucking huge. <laughs> yeah. Like as soon as I saw him in the Marilyn makeup, in the makeup chair, I was like, holy shit. Amazing. Um, but I felt the same way with Maroon 5. Yeah. You know, when, Fel when Jordy Feldstein and I were taking that around and shopping it. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody was passing. And yeah. I was like, these songs are hits. Like, what are, like, what are people doing? You mm -hmm. know, I remember uh, uh, as I don't want to like just keep putting people on blast, but like I remember you, an, an executive, we'll yeah. just say, at the Interscope Showcase, leaned over to Jimmy and whispered in Jimmy's ear, they're just a Jamiroquai ripoff. Let's go. I'd love a good Jamiroquai ripoff. Sure, right? Yeah. Like, why not, yeah. right? Um, more people would rip and, off Jamiroquai. Jamiroquai yeah. is incredible. And, um, you know, and they were playing things like Sunday Morning and Secrets, like songs that end up being like iconic records on that Songs About Jane album. Like, they didn't have this love. Yeah. And that they had pretty much everything else on the record. Yeah. And um, everybody passed. Everybody passed. Only James Diener mm. and, and Octone, the only people who made an offer. Mm. <laughs> That's Literally cool. one one small label under BMG with an upstream yeah. uh, component to J Records. Yeah, you know. I mean, that, 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 it, other, he passes Maroon Five never happens. Crazy. I mean, that's so interesting, and it and it's like there's thousands of these stories, yeah. right? And movies and same thing with One Republic. Music and everyone passed except for Velvet Hammer, yeah. David Ben David ben, David Benveniste, Bino, yeah. the only person. I didn't know he worked with One Republic. Bino signed One Republic and to Velvet Hammer. They made that whole album, and then Columbia ended up dropping, like, I feel like, was, I think they said something like 50 Cent, Katy Perry, uh -huh. One Republic, and the Jonas Brothers, all in the same week or something like that. It's like famous, like, week of Columbia sure. dropping these four artists that went on to become massive stars all in the same week. Yeah. Um, but, um, and then, and, you know, obviously, Tim picked it up. And, but Tim, you know, Tim's uncle, Marcus, was managing... Mm. One Republic when they were signed to Velvet Hammer, mm -hmm. so it, was, it made sense. You know, sure. Ryan used to Ryan had been signed to Beat Club as like a ghost producer during like the Bubba Sparks days. Got it. Um, Crazy. So, you know, they already had a pre-existing relationship. But yeah. again, even even back then, like before Tim had a label, like Velvet Hammer was the only company that made an offer yeah. on One Republic. No yeah. one, even Diener, when he when I showed it, went back to Octone with it yeah. after Maroon Five was already successful, said, "I mean, I already have Adam." Like, what do I, I don't need Ryan. I already had right. Adam. Sure. I'm like, you, like, that's silly. You could have had both, right? <laughs> so we were talking about the kind of twists and turns. So songwriting, obviously, yeah. was so the like, thing. So the label, Interscope, yeah. till like 98, right? right? 90, around that time. Uh -huh. um, I went to, a, I don't know if you remember this, I went to Immortal Records. Oh, yeah. I was so pissed. I went, went down to Interscope. And that, that I was so young, again, not asking for help, not right. asking for advice. I should have just been like, okay, cool. You know what? Fuck it. Go do it again. Right. Instead, one of the people who worked for Wally -E was like, I'm going over to this label. I know they did you wrong. Come with me. Mm. And I was like, yeah, fuck this. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And I went to Immortal, mm -hmm. which was the worst six months of my life. Sure. <laughs> my last day at Immortal, I walked in and they were like, hey, um, I'm not sure this is working out. And I was like, me neither. Do I have to stay to the end of the day or can I leave now? <laughs> and they were like, you can leave now. And I was like, cool, here's the key. Awesome. And I literally left and I drove right to you. 
That's awesome. I literally came right to you, and I was, and I was like, I want to learn how to manage. Teach me. And so, did I teach you anything? Yeah, I think so. That's weird. I mean, you were managing the Baker Boys and mm -hmm. Kidney Thieves and mm -hmm. uh, Dubsy. Dubsy, yeah. Yeah. And Bosco. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean. I mean, I made a lot of cassettes. No, no, I mean, I did. I, I learned stuff. We did. We did make a lot of cassettes. But, but, um, um, and then, yeah, I went. I, I mean, I learned a lot as a manager of what not to do in the rest of my career. Oh, my God. And the, and the first one is, is, is what you said is asking for help. Because I, yeah, for sure. I used to be so terrible at that. The worst, right? And, like, everybody right. was the worst at that. Yeah. And I, you know, yeah, I guess so. I think, every, now I think like, everybody when they first start out is bad at that. And maybe. I encourage people. Yeah. You're not on your own. Do, ask yeah. for help. You had yeah. a village around you. Build a yeah. village. First of all, build a village. Build friend, a friend base, you know? Like, right. maybe you can be like, what would you do in this situation? And don't be like, like, let your ego drive that, right? Like, I think that's where people are like, well, no, for if, sure. if I show weakness, no, it's all them, ego. they're, they're going to think that I'm not, totally. like, I don't know my shit. It's like, You're 100% right. And now that's all I care about is learning. I ask people questions all the time. All, that's all I want <laughs> is to learn, right? Um, but I think back to those, you know, I was 23. Yeah. And, you know, I got to spend an afternoon with Lior and with Russell and with yeah. Craig, you know, multiple afternoons with Craig Kalman. I didn't learn a fucking thing from any of them because I was too busy trying to project like who you are, what, what I, I do. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stupid. Yeah. It's, we all are. We all do that. Yeah. So, so what was the, when did you realize that, like, you had found your thing? Well, so in, in, in um, when I was working with you, I went to, um, I went to the Winter Music Convention with my cousin Todd, mm -hmm. who was like in the electronic space, and he was kind of like helping out people like DJ Dan and Roy Davis Jr. and like nice. Donald Glaude, and yeah. like he was like friends with all like the oh, that's cool. moonshine people or whatever. So he's like, come to Miami with me for Winter Music Convention. And when yeah. I was there, I met, uh, I bumped into some guys I used to rap with, who were the group Styles of Beyond, mm -hmm. and I convinced them that I was a manager. And that I sh I should manage them. Nice. And they picked me. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, and uh, and then I learned I did everything you could ever do wrong as a manager. Yeah. And I ended up getting fired like you know after 2000 Fold came out or whatever. Um, I think uh, after at least one or two uh, very intense conversations with Divine Styler. <laughs> Right. <laughs> there was a, the writing was on the wall that I should bow out of this. Um, and I decided to continue to manage, and I ended up connecting with Walt, Walt Licker. Uh -huh. And we started managing people together, like Planet Asia and oh, you cool. know, all the you know, Mystic, Zion yeah. I, Living Legends, like all that stuff. And that's when nice. I partnered with Jordan, mm -hmm. and he came on, and, and uh, he brought in, you know, Karis Flowers, which became Maroon, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was... <laughs> I remember he was managing like Freddie Fox. Jordan Feltz, he managed Freddie Fox. It That's like hilarious. It's a funny thing to me. Um, but um, I did management for a while and yeah. then um, that fell apart and then I just was managing my own. I was managing this this kid Vicious from, from Detroit um, mm -hmm. who was going to be like the next Eminem, mm -hmm. white rapper from Detroit. Um, and I got him signed to DreamWorks. Nice. Michael Goldstone and Jeff Sosno signed him to DreamWorks. Uh -huh. And... Uh, and then this keyboardist who, who Treglin had brought in on the project, Justin and I signed Vicious together. Mm -hmm. he, was signed to Justin, he was signed to Justin's production company, and okay. I was managing Vicious. And, uh, and we brought in this keyboardist that Justin found from the Bay named Jonathan Rodham. Mm. And uh, I ended up managing him, and, uh, and it obviously, so I was managing Vicious and JR before he was JR. And then I met this girl, and uh, I got into some partying and headed down the wrong path and it became more about the nightlife mm -hmm. than the day than the work and um wally had hired me to do a and r scouting when he went to warner and i just kind of blew it all yeah. i literally just fucked it all off like i literally got fired by everybody vicious got dropped uh i lost my gig at warner like and in 2004 i ended up moving back home mm and got a part-time job working at a, li a lighting store, a lamp store on, okay. on Melrose. Wow. <laughs> I worked so three, you did have a job outside of music. Three days a week working at Fantasy Lighting, which doesn't no exist way. anymore, on La Brea and Melrose. Yeah. And um, on Saturdays, I would answer phones at Morton's. Okay. Not like Arnie Morton's, like Morton's Morton's before, uh -huh. before it was Chaconi's. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, and I was, like, living at home, like, you know, doing coke and... <laughs> 
living the good life <laughs> in my mom's guest room. Okay. <laughs> and then I basically, um, my stepdad was like, you got to get a real job. And I was like, I got to work in the music industry, but I didn't want to go to label and I didn't want to management company because I had too much pride, of course. Yeah. I was like, I can't, I think, I think I'm starting over. So I went to, uh, I went to an agency and mm -hmm. I begged for an assistant job. Ben mm -hmm. Gordon had introduced me to this guy, Josh Humiston, mm -hmm. um, who was looking for an assistant. And I basically Josh. came, RIP Josh, and RIP Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately for both of them. Um, they were both good, really good friends. Yeah. And, um, but um, they, uh, I basically conned Josh into giving me an assistant job and told him I was gonna be a really good assistant and I was terrible. But what I did say to him is I could find bands for I'm you. I'm sure he had a lot of terrible assistants. Yeah, probably. I was like, look, I can find bands for you. Teach me how to be an agent and I'll do anything for you as an assistant. Nice. And he said, against my best judgment, I'm gonna hire you. <laughs> <laughs> but we became fast friends. We became that. fast yeah. friends, and awesome. um, I, we were probably more friends than we were assistant boss. Yeah. And um, and I, I loved him a lot. And um, and he he saved me. You know, yeah. he gave me a job when I really needed one. And about five months later, I got sober. Yeah. And then in my sobriety, I started feeling really creative again. Um, and I've been sober ever since, like eight, almost 18, 18 and a quarter years now. Nice. You know. Um, and. Uh, in my sobriety, I just I was like, I want to put together a girl group, mm -hmm. and that's when the girl group happened. Oh wow! In in sobriety, yeah. and uh, and then you know Zach Katz was was managing Jr. was mm -hmm. like, you should write the songs, and so I started writing. The, I just wrote the songs. I was getting all my songs from Jr. Uh -huh. before Jr. blew up, and Ryan Tedder before Ryan Tedder blew up. Amazing. I always say like, if I was going to make that album two years later, it would have cost me two million bucks. Sure. <laughs> they became Crazy. like the two biggest producers on the planet within two years, yeah. but at the time, no one knew who the hell they were. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, and then, you know, a little bit of, like, destiny, I think. I think it was just meant to be. I think that was the path I was supposed to be on. And, yeah. And um, so it wasn't then, though, that I knew I could do it. Okay. I, I basically, I really wanted to, I wasn't really sure. So I spent yeah. four months. The song goes number one. Mm -hmm. And the same day the song goes number one, I get made West Coast Club agent at okay. PA. Literally yeah. the same day. Yeah. May 6th. Wow. Insane. Right, um, and so now I was faced with this dilemma, like this company that like saved right. my life, yeah. basically. Sure, I'm not going to leave them. And you have a number higher, one song, higher dry, but I have they do have the number one song in the world in 20 yeah. countries. So it's kind of a it's kind of a, a dilemma here. Crazy. And so I became the West Coast club agent at APA, and I was booking all the clubs from like you know, um, Seattle all the way from Seattle all the way down to San Diego, and you know everything in between, and. Um, you know, One Republic before mm -hmm. they were One Republic and a couple other bands. And um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I didn't know what to do. So about four months into it, like, Zach was like, every day, Zach and Jared would call and say, you got to leave the agency. I was like, I can't leave the agency. I got a job. I got like, insurance, yeah. Yeah. expense account, like office. I can't leave. I'm sober. Can't leave. You got to leave. You got to leave. We need you in the studio. And at night, I'd go in the, right in the studio, but like, we need you during the day. And... Um, and finally, they were like, "What's it going to take for you to leave the studio, leave the uh, agency?" And I said, "I don't know. Put me in the studio with Britney Spears." And then the next week, we spent the entire week in Vegas working on Blackout. Wow. And I came back and I quit, and I went and wrote full time. But even then, I didn't feel like I still felt like an imposter. Yeah, you know, yeah. like I had as a one hit wonder. And Jr. quickly soon after signed Sean Kingston. Yeah, and. I wasn't really working on that. It was a rap project. Yeah. His name wasn't Sean Kingston. It was franchise. He was a rapper signed mm -hmm. signed to Net Worth, which was JR and Zach's company okay. through, through Epic. Yeah. And then he went in. Do you know Sly? No. He was a songwriter that worked with Dre at the time. Anyway, Sly and and Sean Kingston went in, and the next morning we came in and it was the chorus to Beautiful Girls. Mm -hmm. And overnight, they were like. We're singing everything. Sure. So I came in and rewrote a lot of the songs with Sean. Wow. To be songs. Amazing. Not rap songs. Yeah. And Tommy wrote him, named, JR's brother named him Sean Kingston. His name is Kashawn Anderson, and mm -hmm. his family's from Kingston, Jamaica. So he Great. changed the name to Sean Kingston, and he became a singer basically overnight. And they changed the name of the company from Net Worth to Beluga Heights. And it was this legend was launched, and that, Amazing. and then "Take You There" came out as like the third single, and yeah. obviously became like my second hit. Yeah. And then I felt like, you know what, I can do this. That was the moment that I felt like I could do it. That's amazing. Um, I think that the 
you know, people call it imposter syndrome, whatever. That I think that feeling is so important. Yeah. It's not fun. No, it sucks. <laughs> but it's it's essential. Right? And I, I I think, you know, first of all, the people that don't have that are really you just don't want to be around them. <laughs> <laughs> like Elon Musk probably doesn't have imposter syndrome because no. he's a, just a garbage yeah. human being, right? Yeah. That you don't want to be around, right? Yeah. But um and obviously, you, you could take it too far, and it can be crippling or whatever. But, but managing that, working through it, is such an important part of getting to where you're going in life, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I didn't. Thanks for sharing. I didn't. I didn't know a lot of those details. Of, I think know. imposter syndrome. Yeah, my I mean, my pleasure. I mean, like my imposter syndrome to me it has a bit has a bit of humility in it. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. that's, that's that's what informs imposter syndrome for sure. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah, and you, we need that, right? Because I don't ever really actually feel like I hope they don't find me out. You know, I hope they find you know whatever right. kind of thing like that. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, man, like you know, I think as a music creator, you, it's hard for you not to sometimes be like, man, do I really have it? Right. Yeah. Like, have I just gotten fucking lucky? Sure. You know, like, and then you have to like think about moments where you came up with something that no one on earth could have come up with. Yeah. And the moment that the lightning struck your head, uh -huh. you know, yeah. and you're like, oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have it, I have it, I have it. So, uh, you know, now you're super successful and all that shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what it says on my LinkedIn. What do you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, so that experience of your career falling apart, moving back home, starting over, what do you carry with you today? Like, how does that help you today, having gone through that? Um, I, I always talk about moments in life where you have to pivot. Mm. I think a lot of people hit these walls and yeah. they, and, and they're so dejected by it yeah. that they retreat. Yeah. I think a lot of times people in like the music industry will have these like lulls, like these lows and, and, uh, they, um, they don't come back from it. Yeah. And I think that For they, sure. I think that's, I think it's very, it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, it's hard. I think the ind music industry and probably other industries, but the music industry from my own experience is a lot of, it's, a, it's like a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of like yeah. riding the waves. Totally. Um, and I think sometimes people get so low in the wave that they can't, they can't ride it back up. Yeah. And what I learned mo many moments in my life, whether it was the M&M situation, whether it was um, the management, you know, the, the, the situation of, of throwing everything away and mm -hmm. moving back home, mm -hmm. um, starting over as a booking agent, um, making the decision to leave the booking agency and go be an unemployed songwriter. Yeah. <laughs> um, albeit having a number one, but still never, sure. no promise of number two, of yeah. second number one. Yeah, right? that, yeah. Um, and um, then signing acts again. And then most recently, starting a brand new company in 2020 yeah. and from scratch with in, in institutional money and partners, you know, in, yeah. money in investment partners, private yeah. equity partners. But like, like it's all about, for me, it's all about these moments of pivot. Mm -hmm. Like I take, I, I take things a certain, I take things a certain way and then I find ways to like pivot and grow from it, mm -hmm. pivot and grow from it. Mm -hmm. Like that has been the kind of through thread of my career is it. like, Travel on this journey, travel on this journey, travel on this journey, and then I hit a fork in the road or a wall, and I figure out what, what's my growth path. Yeah. How do I go, instead of like, I can't go through it, and I can, I'm not gonna go back. Right. So how do I, yeah. grow, how do I grow around it? Wow. You know, like, like uh, you know, like, you know, Tupac with the rose and the concrete, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, yeah. like, I think it's, it's, it's similar to that. Like, yeah. how, do I, how do I grow this vine around? <laughs> around the, the wall that I just hit and sure. through the cracks so it grows again into another, the next thing. Yeah. Um, and so I call it pivoting. You know, like I've made, an, I've made my entire career and personal life out of pivoting, getting sober, yeah. um, you know, going through divorce, getting remarried, um, having a child, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with death, dealing mm -hmm. with loss, dealing with, you know, um, I don't know, whatever, lawsuits, thing, any, whatever that comes your sure. way, right? And I think, I think that, um, I think there's a, there's an understanding of acceptance 
which I think comes from my sobriety, mm -hmm. you know, serenity mm -hmm. prayer and, and, and whatnot. <laughs> um, I think I'm really in tune with acceptance and, 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 um, and I think from that acceptance, I'm, once you accept something, you're able to grow from it. Yeah. I think it's the denial and the resentment and the fear that holds people back. And by the way, it's not, fu it's not, it's not fun right. sometimes to pivot, yeah, yeah, sure. and it's not, not fucking scary. Right. But um, one of my mottos is lean in. Mm -hmm. I have it written on a, on a sticky note on my desk, taped right. to my desk at home. And for me, it's all about like when I think about waves, yeah. right? And I think about riding these waves. Yeah, yeah. And I think about when you're in the ocean and the wave is going to crash on you. If you turn around and you run from the wave, it always mm -hmm. knocks you over. Sure. The only way to yeah, not get knocked over is go is dive into the wave, right? You have to yeah. go through it. So like I think about that as like lean in. And yeah. shit gets tough, lean in. I mean, I love that and I and I also think, you know, when we're successful, we make up stories about that we deserve it, that we earned it, that it's it was it was all about us or that we're entitled or right? And uh, and some of that's true. It's not you know, there's truth in that, but it doesn't teach us things, right? If, if anything, yeah, it, it, it almost makes the next thing harder. Yeah, it hinders us. Right. It holds yeah. us back. Yeah, absolutely. It's that, well, e it's that ego that holds you back. Yo, that was Evan Bogart on Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, make sure you come back next week. We're talking about spinning gold. It's a great movie. I hope you go see it. In fact, your homework is go see the movie between now and next week so that you know what the hell we're talking about. Um, and there we go. 